It's time for the big conversations, telling stories of movers and shakers, of industry giants and daring professionals. It's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life, the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward. If you don't know where these conversations are found, we are sending you a GPS. But if you're listening to this voice right now, you are here. Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. All right, welcome to another exciting episode of the Growth Podcast. We are here to have another interesting conversation. Uh, we've we've had a number of conversations, counting down to 100 conversations um, on the podcast. I'm sure next year we'll hit 100 um, conversations. My guest on this week's edition of the podcast um, is a very familiar voice. For some of you, you know him. For others, um, you don't know him, but when he opens his mouth the first time, you go like, ah, that's him! Yeah, he's, he's that kind of guest. But, but let, me, let me give you an idea um, of who our guest uh, this week is. Um, maybe this will, 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 will jag your memory. Um, this week on Zambezi Magic. <laughs> you, you sound so, so like you're the one who does it. <laughs> Do another. Let's. No, like, you know, like, I feel like you've really become a household. Like just that voice, you know. Uh, sometimes, somehow you feel like it's one of those AI stuff. And, and very consistent. Chilu Lemba um, is, is my guest on the podcast this week. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you Mike. so much, Rilanj. I was told, jokingly, that you have a promotion on easy questions. <laughs> I know we have, we have, we no, know no, but, we, we but, have. But let me, let me, by disclaimer, because, because, uh, you know, for anybody listening, I was like, Swilanji, ask some tough questions. I don't know if I want to be there. But then, yeah, take that out the way, ask whatever you want. I'm, I'm, I'm here. No, we, we, we are obviously here to <laughs> milk you of all your wisdom. <laughs> um, and, and I look forward to the conversation because really I feel like. And like I told you yesterday, I feel like you are you are you are a proud export for us as a oh, country. Bless, yeah. yeah, you are a proud export for us as a country, and I feel like um, I feel happy when I hear you mention Zambia, because I think I saw you unboxing your award, uh, the one that uh, your wife oh. filmed, <laughs> and you're saying my guys in Zambia. For my guys in Zambia, I was yeah, like, yes, yeah, we feel yeah, represented, yeah. <laughs> because I think mostly people when they make it out there, they want to disassociate themselves like, from, like, from the, the yeah, yeah the roots the and like you know this is where I am now. Mm, but mm. for me, really, I feel like you you're doing the most. Um, I don't know a bigger African uh, voiceover artist. I don't know. That's. Well, because I've never actually thought of it in, in, in those terms. Usually I'd counter it and say, no, but there's so-and-so. <laughs> but I've never given it, you know, that, that much thought. But it's it's been an, an incredible journey. And, you know, the, because of the fact that, um, you know, obviously I started out uh, as a voiceover artist and radio presenter here in Zambia. And a lot of the um, quote-unquote success has also uh, been in South Africa. So... When I get onto platforms like the one that you're mentioning, which was the Sovas Voice Arts Awards in LA last year, you have to kind of pay homage to both or oh, homage is the because <laughs> to, to both countries, you know, in a sense, because they've both played a role in terms of the trajectory of where, where I'm currently sitting. So it's it's a balancing act because if you do too much Zambia Kuchalo, <laughs> well, dudes in South Africa will be like, "Oh, these jobs that you're nominated for are from us. Exactly, <laughs> you know we are I mean? the ones. That We're are the ones know. who. Yeah, these are our scripts, our productions, your voice. So you know, it's it's a balancing act. But uh, in in all, in you know, I'm, I'm I'm a grateful guy to I should just say to the continent for for you know uh, giving a platform to guys like us. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got icebreaker questions. I don't oh, know sure. if you classify them as difficult, but I feel like they're friendly. Let's see. Um, I'm going to give you five. Okay. I'm going to give you five. Uh, some of them, I think, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll still keep coming back to them, even if you, <laughs> uh, you, you miss. My disclaimer is like, I, I blabber a lot. So, you know, I, I might spend, you, you, you will have to rein me and I could go 20 minutes on one question. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, one. I want you to choose. Oh, oh um, am I picking them and, and reading them out? Or? Yeah, you pick oh, them and okay. read them out. Yeah, okay, you pick right, them and you read right, them out. Right. Um, okay, let's start with these three. Okay, cool. So let me start with the third one you've given me. Dun, dun, dun. Describe an argument you had that helped shape the person you are today. That's a tough one. Because <laughs> I, I really, but, but before, while I think about it, there's, there's, um, I was listening to an interview with Jimmy Jam and, uh, from, from the duo Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, the producers. And, those two as a production partnership have been uh, around for about 50 years. 
So Can You Stand the Rain, New Edition, Janet Jackson, almost all her albums and all her hits, they produce that, that stuff. And he was saying within their partnership, when he tells people that they've never had an argument, people get shocked. But he says there's a difference between an argument because with an argument, you want to win. With a disagreement, you have different points of view. And so it's, it's a different way to establish it. Um, in terms of argument, um, describe an argument you had that helped shape the person you are today. Okay, I'll go back to one that's in my book, which was uh, me in the office at Radio Phoenix back in 1996 with Mrs. Pemba. And at that point, uh, Mrs. Pemba was the general manager, just for context. And I had been a radio presenter. I was on a high. I was, you know, uh, public, what, what do you call it, in the, in the public domain, doing all sorts of things. And then came to a point whereby I was asked to do a show, and I said no for the first time. So I'd been saying yes to every assignment I was given, but I was feeling burnt out. And what was happening at the time was um, the people from the marketing department, if they brought a show my way, they would get a commission for the duration of that that show. Whereas I was on salary, so I didn't really get a cut from from those deals. You know what I mean? And so I was saying yes because it was fun at first. Like, yeah, give me the show, you know, do it. You know, the, the client loves it. Uh, but the marketing, one particular marketing person just kept dumping these shows at me. And in my mind, I'm thinking, but no, man, she's <laughs> making a lot of money. I'm getting burnt out because now I've got like more shows that I can do. So she brought one and I said, uh, no, I won't. And then she went to report me at the general manager's office and says he's refusing to do a show. Now I'm in this office and without, con you know, maybe uh, the general manager at the time understanding the full extent of why I was saying no just thought I'm being a difficult guy. So we're having this argument and I could sense that she was about to kind of put an ultimatum my way and so I quit. So that was the first time that I said no. That was the first time that I quit on a job, <laughs> you know. But then the month after quitting that job allowed me um, about a full month to reevaluate my situation. And so within that month, I, I kind of got the full extent of what my decision was. Uh, I got a, a, a bit of um, uh, an understanding again of what it feels like to be unemployed. <laughs> there were some opportunities that were at the cusp of breaking, but because now it's no longer associated with the radio station, they're like, no, we can't deal with you. So a lot happened within that month, which just kind of helped me to refocus. And within that month of, of quiet, uh, my mother introduced me to some tapes by a preacher called Mensa Otterbill. Um, who spoke wisdom through those audio cassettes. And uh, yeah, so, so I can actually point to that part, uh, to, the, to that argument being almost like a catalyst to a rebirth because then I came back stronger. I went back to the station, but on a part-time basis, I was now getting paid for the shows that I was doing, you know. So, so my, even my positioning changed. And then, you know, a few months later, I think they noticed that this guy's headspace is different. I became the acting station manager. At, at Radio Phoenix. So describe an argument that helped shape the person you are today. That's the one. Did that work for you? <laughs> yeah, just, let's go to the next cut. <laughs> okay, let's see. He's a tough man. I thought... <laughs> <laughs> what negative traits do you publicly laugh about but secretly know you have to fix? What negative trait do you publicly laugh about but secretly know you have... And these, a negative trait to do with me, right? Yeah. <sighs> okay, this one might be silly, but you know, it's, I usually, almost every interview, if you listen to, to me being interviewed nowadays, I'm like, yeah, I'm showing my age, I'm showing my age, you know, because cause I'm starting to feel old, you know, with the gray hair and stuff. I saw but, that on the, on the Newsroom Africa interview. I, I, yeah, I joked, yeah, you see, see, so I'm not going to say it here, so I, 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 I kind of joke about it publicly, but I know that even though I'm feeling this way, there's certain things that I can do to change. Uh, so for example, you know, in the past couple of weeks, I've started changing my diet. You know, I'm, I'm watching what I'm eating. Um, I had surgery not too long ago as we speak. So as soon as I recover from that uh, fully, then I can start exercising again. So so that joke, I think, you know, if, if I work hard at it, uh, <laughs> you won't be hearing it anymore because I'll be like a Speedo model in my 50s. <laughs> All right. And the third one? Hmm, what compliments do you struggle to believe? You know what? Almost every day I, I get complimented for stuff that, that uh, I do based on, on how 
my my profession and my craft allows me to to interface with people. So for instance, I mean somebody who's watching this right now might not know that you and I shared a stage at the Quacha Music Awards where we're handing out an award for best indigenous sound or something. Right? Yeah. And before going on that stage, I had already lived the the five minutes of what was gonna happen. You know, so I knew that when we get on, there's a way in which we can probably win the crowd over. And I discussed it with you beforehand and you, you know, gave your input. So we, before we stepped on that stage, we already knew how it was going to unfold, how we were probably going to, to, to bring an energy to the audience. And it worked out, you know, we, we got feedback afterwards. But because of the fact that I'd pre, you know, lived in that moment, you probably also had pre-lived in that moment. When people start now saying, that was brilliant, in my mind, like, but was it really? Because I was... I wasn't in the moment in the moment. I'd lived in that moment before we stepped on stage. So when you step on, when, when you're on stage, you're just kind of thinking, is it working as it was planned, you know? And so maybe sometimes I'm too much in my own head. But then when I watch it later on, because I did go to watch it, you know, <laughs> so everyone like, mm, okay, yeah, it worked, you know? <laughs> then then I start believing those comments that were coming in like, yeah, yeah, killer, killer, you know? Or, yeah. Okay. So I think that's, Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, Ta -da! <laughs> obviously, obviously more questions coming, but I wanted to go back to, to, okay. to, to becoming, the process of becoming. Yeah. Because I know that uh, obviously Rinja's Gigadin and O's, mm. biggest you know, voiceover artist. Mm. Let's, let's go way back okay. um, to, to, to your school days. Where did you do your school? So I, I've been in, in many towns. So I started, uh, I'll even go as far back as preschool. Preschool was Jack and Jill in Northmead, where Northmead Assemblies of God Church is right now. Um, that's where I think I started uh, enjoying the language. Uh, you know, I, I was acing English, reading Jack and Jill and all those uh, what ladybird books or whatever. Um, then from there, I went to Treetops Primary School for a couple of years. Then, um, so, so for context, my mother and father separated like when I was very young, you know. So it meant that in the early part of my life, I was moving between the two households, you know, the, the um, and so... When the Lusaka, you know, schools that I've spoken about, that was during the time I was living with my father, uh, you know, a bit with my mother. And then she transferred to Ndola. So then I went to Ndola, lived with her, and I was at Kansenshi Primary School. Then went to live with my father later on, still primary school, but in Livingston. So I was at Livingston Primary School. <laughs> if you're keeping track, that's a lot of schools. And then I went to St. Raphael Secondary School for about a year in Livingston still. And then boarding school happened, which was a game changer for me. Went to Mukushi. Uh, I was at Chengelo Secondary School for about four years. And then uh, things happened, you know, financially, uh, my father was, wasn't in a position to, to get us back there in the final year. So I actually did not complete grade 12 in the, in the technical sense. Uh, so I didn't leave with a, um, a school certificate. Yeah. So even when I joined Radio Phoenix... I had no no papers to show. <laughs> so I'm telling you, yeah, I became station manager. All that stuff happened and this man had no no formal qualifications to show. Yeah. Did yeah. you go back to finish the Gretel? No. But what, what had actually happened is my late mom thought I could uh, do it part-time at Evelyn Hone College or Evelyn Hone as the, the educated say. But I was so in a very different headspace at the time. I thought we were going to make inroads with rap music, but that's another story. So I wasn't attending those classes, you know, but I, I wrote the exam and that's the first exam I failed, failed, failed. We wrote it at um, Kabalonga Boys. Oh, GC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was the GC one. I flunked that thing, man. I was meant to do, I think, two papers, uh, but I hadn't been to class almost the whole year. I think I only saw my classmates <laughs> twice. So I didn't even show my, my mother. It would have broken her heart, the, the results there. But then later on now, when I started refocusing and recalibrating, I guess, after I left Radio Phoenix, I went to a college in South Africa called the AAA School of Advertising. And uh, yeah, I was th at three years at the AAA and I graduated with a high diploma in integrated marketing communications. I specialized in brand management. And then I also got an IAA marketing diploma. So based on those, retrospectively, you can uh, then motivate that to the Board of Education in South Africa. Then they give you what's called a matric exemption. So because now you've passed the, the level of a grade 12 exam, they give you a, a, a certificate uh, which, which kind of shows that you've met the criteria for that. So I've got that tucked in, which kind of shows that 
I've, I'm past grade 12 level and then I've got the diplomas as well. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's, that's so, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 and, and from, from, from there, um, first of all, what, what took you to SA? So what took me to SA initially, um, if, if I dial back the story, I was enjoying a lot of, of, of success at Radio Phoenix, right? Um, in 1998, I'm the acting station manager. I'm, um, you know, government officials are on speed dial. Uh, the late Kristen Tembo, I, I could have an audience with him in his office. He's the vice president. So things are going well in that respect, right? But at the same time, I'm feeling under-equipped um, and unsure of myself from an education point of view because of what I just told you. Um, and I'm also kind of feeling a restlessness uh, with the space that I find myself in. Because even though I'm the um, acting station manager at that point in 1999, certain things happen where, for example, um, the owner of the station, the late Mr. Errol Hickey, would be at a cocktail. And uh, this particular instance is uh, he met somebody from uh, the Post newspaper, and they were starting like an education pub um, um, education supplement. Post. Yeah, yeah. So, so then he says, "Yeah, no, just go talk to Chilu, get some airtime, you know, talk about this thing on radio." So that guy reaches out to me and says, "Yo, Errol told me that I should reach out to you. Let's let's uh, talk about this on air." So, I, so I say to him, "Cool, uh, give me five minutes." Then I reach out to the GM because obviously, if I put them on air, um, and it, there's a potential that it seems like it's a marketing uh, yeah, angle, commercial, yeah, yeah, it it could, you know. Five, you know, uh, have repercussions on me. So I, I call the marketing office and the GM and say uh, the boss has says A B C D. Uh, GM is like, no, that's a marketing thing. Uh, send them to us. We quote them for it. So I send them to you know marketing GM to quote. Next thing I'm getting a call from Mr. Hickey. What the heck? <laughs> I've, I've given a directive and you're pushing back and you know. So you're caught in these worlds where there are all these you know little things that are nothing to do with you, but you're limited in, in your power and how you can push these things. And there was a lot of politics as well going on, as, as would be in any organization. So I kind of thought this might be the right time to move and do something. And at that point, I'd been doing small little trips to SA, being exposed to what was going on in terms of uh, the MNET ecosystem and so on. So um, yeah, I, I decided I'm going to study in SA and I went to on one of these trips to the Triple A. It's a long story as to how I zeroed in yeah. on the AAA, so I won't get into that. But I uh, got there, did the en entrance exam. They're like, cool. Went back to Zambia. And uh, when I returned, I told them, you know, I'm, I'm about to leave resignation letter. I think it was three months notice. And yeah, that's how I uprooted. So initially, I thought I was just going to study for uh, the diploma at the time was two years. Um, and I thought, you know, after two years, we'll see what's what. But um, it ended up just as a matter of chance while I was in South Africa. The, the education department, they're called SACWA, South African Qualifications Authority. Yeah. They changed the minimum requirement for a diploma from two years to three while, while I was there. So, you know, the principal at the college came through and said, okay, there's been a change. You guys are going to have to be here for three years, even though you... So I went to his office and I was like, sir, you know, I'm a foreign student. I just budgeted for two years, blah, blah, you know, so please give me my diploma after the two years as agreed. Then he told me, but it won't be worth the paper it's written on. Those were his words. So what we'll do is we'll find a, a company that will fund your third year. Then in exchange, you'll probably have to work for them for whatever. So I'm like, oh, that's that's a good deal. <laughs> so so Young and Rubicam South Africa uh, paid for my third year. Uh, and then in turn, I had to work for them for a year and a half. And so that that was just the beginning of me staying in South Africa for a longer period than than anticipated. All right. Yeah. And And at that particular point, had you discovered your voiceover abilities? Yes, because the voiceover stuff I started doing in Zambia. So by, by the time I was going to South Africa, I'd already been, um, you know, three years into doing voiceover. I, I, I was doing voiceover at Radio Phoenix from, see, the first one I did was 95 uh, before I joined Phoenix. Then while I was at Phoenix, I did a lot of them. And then I, I did the, I was the voice of the MMD campaign in 96. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Vote MMD, you know. Uh, when, uh, you know, late uh, President Frederick Chilua was running. Um, and yeah, so I did that when Zambia Privatization Agency was coming up. I, I did the voiceover for that campaign. That's when I met uh, Mr. Peter Armstrong, uh, who I still interact with to this day. 
Um, so I, I'd been doing like big campaigns uh, in Zambia. Then when I moved to South Africa, I thought it would be a similar transition where I'm studying, doing voiceover. In fact, that's what the, the registrar at, at AAA said. No, I'm sure you'll have fun. You'll be studying, you'll be doing voiceover. That's not how it worked out <laughs> because I was studying, not doing voiceover, but rather I was a waiter for like a year, six months. I was a waiter at a restaurant because the voiceover opportunities were just blocked. Um, as as happens when you in a, in a foreign space, you know it takes time before people start uh, accepting that you are a, a, you know a candidate for those opportunities. So it took about three four years before I I really got into the slipstream of voiceover in South Africa. It was like a long time, even though I'd proven myself in Zambia, even though I had like you know videos of me doing my thing. The South African uh, voiceover industry was very different. Different yeah. competitive. More competitive because it's it's a much bigger market in in terms of uh, the way the way it's set up in Zambia. Uh, voiceover artists sometimes you know maybe things change, but sometimes will be involved in writing the script and yeah. you know organizing the the whole thing before the production. Whereas in South Africa, everyone's got their lane in which they operate in. So I don't write scripts, you know, and you know what I mean. I understand the script when it's sent to me. Sometimes it has a guide voice, uh, but there's a script writer. There's a voiceover actor who comes at the end. There is an, an editor. There is a producer. There are all these other people who, who play a role in a production. So by the time you see this thing going on air, sometimes I'm in I'm in the studio and there's like maybe seven, eight people in there because they've all had a stake in the production that you're doing. Um, and so that just kind of just goes to show you that the the budgets, the productions, are at a different level, you know, uh, compared to what what we do in Zambia. And it's 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 a it's I guess a function of how bigger the economy is compared to to where we sit in Zambia. So it's it's a different, um, very different industry. They're, they've got rules which govern how people are paid. Um, if there's renewals, that's all you know. You, before you even do the thing, you know you know what you're dealing with in terms of how how it will pan out. So th- those are the kind of disciplines which we don't have much here. But you know, to to each their own. It's 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 um, our our situation. I think is similar to maybe markets like Nigeria, where also they're having similar conversations about how to to get uh, regulation through through the industry, even Kenya, because I was speaking recently on my voiceover podcast to a lady called Jennifer Kanari. She is the founder of uh, an organization called Volk, Voice Actors League of Kenya. And they're having those conversations too, like can we borrow some of the information that, that we see in other territories and integrate them where we are, you know, so yeah. Okay, and when was your big break? So in South Africa, right? Yeah, I'd say being the voiceover for a, a series called Coca Cola Pop Stars, which was in two thousand and two, two thousand two, two thousand three. Uh, so that's yeah, that's about four years after me landing in Joburg. And why I say that was my big break is because that was a, a, a nationally broadcast show, which um, the, se- the season was 13 episodes uh, deep. So meaning that for me as, as a voiceover guy, and I auditioned for it and I, you know, managed to, to, to get it against a lot of veterans, you know. Um, even, even when we were on episode one, I think my agent got a call saying, I think they're changing the, the voice. Because, because obviously it's a big budget show and uh, I was not tried and tested within that, that uh, particular market. So I think they want they wanted to backpedal and change <laughs> the the guy who was gonna do the voice, but uh, somebody in there fought for me. I think it was the director Matthew uh, Mulholland and and a few others. Um, so I ended up doing the show. So it was thirteen episodes. R- recording each episode would take maybe three hours or so, and I'm grateful for that show because one, it put me out there, um, but two, it also helped me to learn the nuances of. Um, how things are said in South Africa, for example. So in in Zambia, you know, the common thing is it's a dance competition. In in South Africa, if you're doing voiceover, it'll be a dance competition. You know, I mean, there's a difference within the way that they they pronounce and all that stuff. You can learn doing thirty second ads over a period of time because you know the directors will will tell you what what to do. But Coca Cola Pop Stars, because it was a compressed um, thirteen week period of recording. I was learning those things almost every week. Like, no, we, 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 they can't put this out if I'm saying 
you know, okay, that's the, the easy, easiest example is the dance versus uh, dance and chance versus chance, <laughs> you know. But they'd be like, no, that's an Americanism. That's what they call it, you know. That's an Americanism, so we have to change that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of got a fay with uh, how you pronounce the local towns, the local cities, because you need that stuff. If you're operating in a different market, the only way you can be successful is if you don't so say something that sounds odd, you know. So, so if, for example, uh, the road is Jan Smuts. You read that, it's you, you'd say Jan Smuts, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> you're seeing a J. a J, not a Y, you know what I mean? It's like Volkswagen. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, in, in Afrikaans, the Vs see, are actually wrong. Fs. Oh, you got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the Vs are Fs. So, like, for example, um, it's in Namibia, but, but you'd read it as Walvis Bay. Whereas when I've just recently done a voiceover for a company called, um, you see, I have to think about it. <laughs> Actually, I had the recording clip on standby each time I said it, but the V is an F. So it's Falfus Bay is how you say, it, is how it's supposed to be said, you know. So all these things you have to, you know, kind of over time figure them out. You can't say Bayer's Nord. That's how it looks when you read the word, but it's Bayer's Nordia. Um all these things, they take time before you start, you know. <laughs> Did you ever do a them. recording and they send it back to you because you pronounce it wrong? The good thing is like most times the directors would be in the room, especially in the early days. Nowadays, because I'm recording a lot of stuff on my own studio and sending it out, then I have to have various resources to figure out pronunciations. But back in the early days, the directors would be in the room to correct it. And on, on some instances, they'd be pushed back if it's... So So here's an example. Um, years ago now, I'm doing the voiceover for Miss South Africa. One of the sponsors is um, the company that at the time owns Zambezi Sun. So it must have been the Sun Group. I can't remember. But then they say, please... Uh, so I, I read this thing as uh, three, the winner will win three nights at the Royal Zambezi Hotel. Director is on some... Can you please say Zambezi? Like, but it's not Zambezi, <laughs> you know. I, I'm from Zambia. It's Zambezi. Um, okay, can you just like maybe give us a safety read where we j we won't use it, but just in case where we say Zambezi, <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. because because uh, now I'm I'm in a position of no, no, that, that word, that yeah. word, no, you know. But uh, in in many other instances, I'm the one who's getting corrected, and understandably so, because I'm the guy who has to. Um, kind of plug into how it's said there, you know. So it happens a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so for you, yours is 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 a perform personal performance based craft. Yes. Right. You, you yes. can't delegate. You can't. You know. Um, yes. And until AI, you know, <laughs> picks up and and, and do yeah. a voice like Chilulem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. It's 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 a yeah. It's a tough one. You have to you have to be there. But I joke about AI. I've actually between you and me and the millions of people watching, I've, I've actually got uh, into a position where I've cloned my voice uh, with AI. I'm the only one who has access to it, obviously. Um, so I, I, But I can type out a script and the AI will read it back in my voice. Um, not 100% perfect, but what that does, and I'll play you a clip afterwards, so maybe I can play it now if, if I pick up my phone, is I can speak a different language. Where's your phone? Um, yeah, let me let me, <laughs> let, let me let me let me see if I can find it. But this this will be interesting. It's on airplane mode, so you won't have that interference. But let me let me try and find if I can play you a clip of me saying something in uh, in Hindi. So it will be my voice, but in Hindi, uh, you know. Um, yeah, speak away while I look for this clip. <laughs> Who did I send it? Yeah, to? no, see. no, I'm very confident that you find it uh, within no time. I I know I sent it to. Uh, okay, let me see. I'm trying to see who I sent it to. Because to, I've sent it to limited people because obviously you don't want to let the the world into this uh, too early. Um, yeah, so so what, 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 what that does is it allows you to potentially harness the power of AI to make you accessible in more markets once AI comes on board and, and you know, and understands how to properly translate. I like the it. fact that you've you've locked it. Yeah. Okay. There we Otherwise, go. you just be watching TV and your voice is all over. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Oh no, sorry, no, that's wrong. One. Let's see. Put it just. Here. The speaker is down. The speaker is down. No, the... 
Isn't that the top one? The speakers at the top. That's your earpiece. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, but the sound is coming from the speaker. So it's supposed to be up. Uh, what's sounding better? You got the headphones on. So is it sounding good? Okay, I'm going to play it again. So that was French, right? Like this. Oh, you want me to put it like that? Yeah, okay, all right. Okay. okay, cool. Okay, let's try again. So, okay, let me play a different one. This, this should be Arabic. How do we come here? How do we reach this place where AI is doing my voice? This is a new world. This is completely text generated. That's uh, Chilu in Hindi. And then I'll let me play Chilu in Arabic, I think. How do we reach this place? How do we reach this place where the human being is speaking the human being? This is a new world. It was created by this book in the whole world. Cancel. Yeah, yeah. So I just typed out in Hindi and it read. Yes. So which which means it's it's probably not hundred percent accurate because what what I've done there is I've typed the text into from English into Google Translate, which sometimes gets yeah. it wrong. Then pushed it through the AI to then with the drop down tell it which language. Then yeah, it gives me this. So I I've got a friend who, for example, is in Angola, and uh, she was saying. The because I tested the the Portuguese uh, one, and she was saying the thing is by default it's giving you the Brazilian um, Portuguese, which is more melodic, more sing songy, uh, versus yeah. the Angola Mozambique Portuguese, which is not as maybe animated or as accentuated. So I think you still need to deal with people in those regions to to kind of perfect and see whether it can work. And then, uh, yeah, but that's where, that's where AI is going, basically. That's what I was telling you. And, and even in English. So let me, so I'll play this in English because I've typed the, the text that you're about to hear. Uh, I've typed it. AI is saying it out. But I never said these specific words. So, oh, but it's okay. in my voice. But this is English. How did we get here? How did we get to this place where AI mimics my voice? It's a whole new world. This speech is totally text generated. So you can see it's it's still slightly robotic, you know what I mean? It hasn't got uh, fully there where it's Perfect. me, me, me. But uh, they'll get there, man. And then I'll be on a beach. <laughs> Please, can you record this? Yeah, sure. Give me two minutes. <laughs> wow, man. Please, you know, another cocktail while I type this into AI. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, world, the world really is evolving. And I'm, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm happy that you're actually getting ahead of it as opposed to being a victim. That's the thing. Because, Sui, I think, like... The two ways it's inevitable that these things are coming through and they're going to affect how we operate. And the only way in my mind that we can um, not be fearful is to see how we can integrate them into how we work. So, so I mean, even right now, there's been that writer strike in Hollywood, yeah, uh, which which lasted uh, for quite a long time. I think it's just it's now you know coming to a close. But that was one of the things that they they they're trying to iron out, like how can uh, if if this technology is available. Why can't somebody else then manipulate it and, and start making money off of me? What protection do I have? So those are the conversations they're having. But from where I'm sitting, I'm thinking, how can I maximize this as a potential opportunity uh, going forward? This could be like three, four years down the line when, when things are uh, a lot smoother, but who knows? Okay. Yeah. When you are starting out, um, tell me about how you used to operate. Mm and how it's different from how you operate today. Yeah. So when I started out, you know, early, early days, 95, 96, it was reel-to-reel -reel machines. It was, uh, then it was mini, mini disc, which was like, whoa, you can record onto a digital thing and not have to wind those, those reels and stuff. But in terms of the major changes, um, I was explaining earlier on that directors had to be in the session physically, especially in the early days. Now what's happened is, in fact, before I do that, I'll tell you a, a, quick, a quick story to, to illustrate the then versus the now. Um, 19, no, no, not 1990. It was like maybe 2000, 2005, 2006, somewhere there. I was the voice for uh, SABC One. So I used to do the lineups. Uh, uh, on Mzansi Magic. This, no, not Mzansi Magic. <laughs> um, SABC, SABC One, yes. yeah. Uh, they, they changed to Mzansi for sure, which is what was confusing me. But at the time, it was uh, SABC One, Yamampela, which is like, it's the real thing. 
um, and I used to be weekly doing that that stuff. Um, in fact, I used to do it every second week. We used to interchange with a lady called Daniela. So Daniela went overseas. So it was now me doing it weekly, and I had to go there. I think every Tuesday to record those those lineups. So comes um, December sometime, I had to go with uh, family to Zimbabwe. Me, my wife, my my newborn at the time, Talita. We go to Zimbabwe. We are holidaying, but I knew on Tuesday I'm catching a flight to Joburg. And when I get to Joburg, I'm booking, I'm hiring a car to the SABC and I'm recording a week's worth of lineups. Then I'm going back to the airport and I'm flying back to Harare by evening and I've flown business class and that was still profitable. But that goes to show you that physically I had to move from one place to another. Now, that would be so weird because there's so many ways in which you can just send audio from where you are. Right now, we could shut down the studio after our podcast. I could record into your system. We MP3 the the file. They mix it into the, you know, because you've got like proper acoustics in your studio. We're done. That's that's what's happened with technology. Uh, there's other technologies like Source Connect. I do some stuff for BBC Africa. Um, and I'm, I'm in a studio which has Source Connect capability. The director is in whatever country, I suspect, in the UK. The directors are definitely at, at the BBC offices in the UK. And I'm here in Africa recording the stuff. They're, they're, sh- they're queuing the promos. I'm getting in you know, where I need to get in in terms of the, the timing of my voice versus the, the dialogue in, in, the, in the rest of the ad. And you know, once we wrap, I'm not even sending them audio because they've captured it in real time using Source Connect. So it's not like, you know, we shut down the system, then like, okay, now I'll send you the audio I recorded. No, they've got it because the internet was so strong and, and the file sizes are good enough to, to go on air. So that's what's uh, majorly been the change. Technology has caught up um, to a point where we can do such stuff. There's some promos which sound extremely good and I see them on air, but I know that this one, I was, uh, you know, I recorded this in my car. Uh, I don't do car recordings, you know, as much anymore because I think now I'm more, <laughs> I'm more quality conscious. But I, I did a lot of voiceovers in my car in car parks, which you'd see on TV. You wouldn't even know that I did them in my car. There's a very strong promo I could show you right now, which I did in my bedroom as I was recovering from uh, surgery. I just kind of knew how to place the, the microphone in tandem with uh, the the wardrobe and the clothes to provide acoustic yeah, assistance. Done You've done that before. <laughs> man, push that thing out and it looks like it was recorded at like the, the dopest studio you've been to. No, man, it was <laughs> right there in the bedroom, you okay. know. So, and, and, yeah. and in terms of like accessibility, then and now, mm. the process for getting Chilu on your ad, how was it then and how is it now? It, so when, when I started, in the 90s, um, it was... If you go, if you had my number, we we talk. You know what I mean. Or if you had the Radio Phoenix number, or whatever. Then later on in the early two thousands, it became mostly agency based. So I had an agent uh, that was representing me for many years, like almost twenty years. And then we had uh, a disagreement. That's the word. We had a disagreement on on something. So then I became independent for about two, three years, totally independent during COVID. So if, if you've got my details, we're negotiating, we're working according to the rate card and I was doing that thing again. And then sometime last year, I then got integrated back into an agency arrangement that uh, we made with a, with a different agency that, that's currently representing me. So yeah, I think getting to me is pretty easy. If, if, if you've got a vibe where I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is um, easy enough to, to work out Usually, you know, we, we could work it out. But most times what happens is I, I my, my antennas are pretty, you know, so I'll be like, yeah, okay, thanks. It sounds good. Here's my agent's number. You know, then I, I only deal with you when it comes to the recording. And then when it comes to admin and payments, you're dealing with the agency. And okay. uh, yeah, for the most part, that, that works out quite nicely. What, what kind of jobs do you enjoy uh, doing voiceovers for? Short ones. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done a documentary? Yeah, I've done it, but in fact, what what that's most of what I do is stuff that you don't see on air. Um, it's more so. I've done. There's a difference between documentaries and corporate AVs. Um, they're both under the category of long form narration, but I do a lot of long form narration for corporate companies. So if you go to a, a mine in South Africa, most times the, you have to watch an induction video before you step into the mine. A uh, good number of times it'll be my voice, you know, giving you guidance on that stuff. 
Um, sometimes it's like company profiles, like the the Falfa Space Salt story I was telling you about. Uh, we did two. One of them talks about the corporate res- social responsibility things they're doing. Another one is a marketing video. So I, I do a lot of those things, which you will never see. But I, you know, award ceremonies where it's citations. Um, you know, for the next award, uh, Sui Lanji uh, started at whatever whatever company in 19, and the award goes to all that stuff, which is like sometimes internal. You'll never see it, but I do a lot of that on 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 phone on hold stuff. If you phone currently, I think DHL Africa. If you phone for tracking a parcel or whatever, I'm there. If you phone, um, I think Sun International. If you're phoning for reserving a booking whatever that's me so i'm i'm in a lot of those spaces <laughs> and does a day uh, yeah. go by without you doing a voiceover really <laughs> <laughs> when after after i was you know uh discharged for, from that surgery story that i keep referring to i uh, that was the first time where i kind of had to stop for um it was meant to be two weeks but um it ended up being a week and then i'm doing bedroom recordings but but no, it's 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 almost like every day there's a session and, and more than one session. So um, now we're recording this in Osaka. As soon as I land in Joburg, I've got on the following day. Um, I think it's four four sessions, and those are the ones where I'm going to studios. So there might be some that I, I still have to do at my own uh, studio, which I'm not counting among those those four sessions. Yeah. Okay. You said I could ask you anything. What's the highest amount of money been paid for a voiceover? Um. I guess enough to buy a small little house. <laughs> yeah, small little. It's, it's, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was for. It was for uh, uh, an Af- Afcon something, because what happens with these things is, the there's two fees that you get as a voice artist. There's the performance fee, and then there's a usage fee. So the performance fee is usually just for you showing up and recording this thing. But the usage fee is dependent on how many channels this thing is going to go on, uh, what duration and all that stuff being worked out. So I'll give you an example of, of a high paying job. Well, I might say an amount, um, but not necessarily the, the biggest paying job I've done. So, um, and I've told this story before, so I think it might be in the public domain. I told you earlier on, I recorded 13 episodes of Coca-Cola Pop Stars. Um, that 13 episodes, the, the, back in 2001 or whatever it was, might have cost, um, you know, like 20, 28,000 or whatever it was. I can't remember. Um, then obviously there's agency fees, et cetera. Dollars, right? Uh, no, no, that, that's rand. Uh, so, no, you're thinking too big. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's to house. <laughs> no, no, but I'm not, ta- that's yes. the thing. I'm not talking about yeah. the biggest job I've got. Okay. I, I've dialed back and I'm talking about uh, giving you an example of another job, you know. So, so I'm, I'm comparing that 13 weeks and juxtaposing it against usage for a, a job that I did shortly after, which was one sentence for Hansa Pilsner. Which, um, the line was, Hansa Pilsner, refresh your soul. That one line paid more than the 28 or whatever for the 13 weeks of me doing pop stars because of usage. Wait, when you say the 28,000, was it that was for the whole series? Yeah, so that was yeah, that, that was that was for the whole series. So keep in mind this is like 20 years ago. I know it's uh, 20 remind, years ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah, there's 20 20 20 yeah, it was 20 years ago, uh upcoming whatever. So even then from from from, from my point of view at that point was a lot of money. Uh, 28,000 rand or whatever it was. But doing shortly afterwards that one sentence and and that one sentence in terms of value being bigger than the 13 weeks just goes to show that it, it depends on how usage pla- placements are done. You know what I mean? Because um, that Hansa Pilsner thing was going to be on a lot of spaces that attracted a, a bigger sum. The, the one that I was saying could buy a little house, that was like, you know, 2008 maybe. And that was for a different job altogether. That one I cannot say figures because uh, I've got family, bro. <laughs> There's a concept called black tax. <laughs> so, so I steer clear from mentioning big, big amounts. But yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, at least might give you an indication of how things unfold. Okay. Yeah. So the way that you operate um, in South Africa, hmm. how is it different from the way that voiceover artists, and not just voiceover artists, but like I said, Yours is a personal performance, you know, mm. business. And in Zambia, also personal performance then caters for your influencers now that that, that space is growing, social mm. media, these guys. 
how it operates here and in a market like SA. How, how is it different and where do you feel like we can improve here? Well, in, I, I think I've commented a couple of times about how the, the industry there is very, very uniform in terms of how they deal. You know, here, for the most part, if I'm correct, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not, I'd, I'd probably have to ask guys like Kamiza, who was on your show earlier on, what the current situation is. Uh, in terms of how it's approached in in Zambia, but I know in SA, it's always if you're asked about something, what's what what does the rate card say? That so there's always a foundation from from when negotiation negotiations can begin, because there's an established for voiceover. It's like a 13 page uh, document which is put together by the PMA. Uh, most times the Personal Managers Association, and most people in South Africa um, will look to that rate card. So. Excuse me. Here, here, it's it's usually very difficult to to kind of even have a platform from which you launch and negotiate these things. Um, yesterday, I was, I was chatting to you about that story with uh, a particular Zambian um, client, who man was very pedantic about how they wanted a production. We we produced it, you know, my company, and we had like four different sound engineers on the job to make it happen, whatnot. And then when it was time for billing, the expectation of how much it would cost was like way, way, way lower than than what the actual production uh, for that particular job was before even profits are, are, are in, in the equation. So that wouldn't have been the case in SA because if you're getting into a job in SA, you kind of already know uh, roughly how things will be based on the existing rate card um, and so I think that's one of the things that I still think needs to happen here where, where minds get together and start at least having a sense of what the minimums are, um, usage rights and stuff like that. So for instance, in, in SA, if I record an ad today and it runs for 12 months on TV, I'll get a phone call and email and they'll tell me we're renewing for another six months. Can you sh- share a quote for us to use the same job for the next six months? I'm like, cool. And we work out a quote and we send it uh, because it's not as if they own the rights outright, unless they pay outright for them for the, for usage, they, they don't own it outright. So um, just, you know, as we speak now about a week ago, there's a radio station in, in fact, two radio, sta- four radio stations, which use my voice hourly in SA. And they've been using them for like, 12 years right now and each each time we're always like in negotiation okay you're, you're, you know what, what's the story now what's the story now so they've just paid for another six months usage because from my understanding they're meant to audition new voices and phase mine out and, and, and introduce new voices but they I think maybe they're overwhelmed with work so they're stuck with paying me <laughs> okay we haven't auditioned guys yet uh, you know so so all those things happen there whereas here I'm, I'm you know chilling with you yesterday at, at uh, that event, and I'm seeing an ad that's that's on screen with my voice, uh, and it sounds great, and I'm like, yo, this this was a good production. But then I'm thinking, this thing was recorded four years ago. So in South Africa, uh, that conversation would have been happening. Like, okay, we're renewing usage for you know having this 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 voice for another twelve months. In Zambia, it doesn't happen. You know, ten years, your voice will be on on an ad, and and no one is. Uh, uh, you know, agreeing to the licensing fees, which is the standard in many other regions. Yeah, in so, Zambia, yeah. they just look at you funny, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> we exactly. Paid what, you. What's this usage? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we paid you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want you to talk to me about value. You you know what your value is. Yeah. You've built this big brand. Um, how did you deal with people coming and saying, no, just just do this like a small voice? And, and that's what they call just a small voice. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, we only have, you've mentioned big figures. They'll come to you and say, no, we only have 10,000 kwacha. Mm. And you're thinking, oh, just as a voice, ten thousand kwacha. Yeah, I mean, so and and by the way, your craft is not like hard labor. Mm, you know, mm, it's mm, just mm, like mm. fun. Just oh, like oh, yeah, welcome yeah, yeah, to yeah, you know. yeah. And, and yeah, and that's what. So you see, it, I think it takes guys who've been in the industry long enough who understand the value of it because you're, now you're talking about value, and it's a good thing we're chatting about this on on your podcast, which is about growth because that's the attitude I would have gone in many years ago with. If somebody says, "No, we've just got so much," and I'd be like, "Yeah," but if that was the case, then those conversations that I'm telling you about, like with that Hansa Pilsner one, 
wouldn't happen because somebody would say, no, it's just one sentence. I'm like, yeah, okay, let me do it quick for you. But you, you, you know, I was lucky enough at the time to have an agent who's like, okay, that one line is going to be used on so many platforms. Uh, but here's the bill, you know, with like lots of zeros uh, after the the one figure. So, um, I think when people understand the value and understand a bit more about the industry, they'll know that if it's like a single word that you need to change on an ad that's been done and they're expecting it to be for free, there's a process whereby I have to like unarchive the original voiceover that I did for you, understand what microphone probably I used then because the microphone texture might be different from the mic that I'm with now in studio and see how I can maybe match that one sentence to drop in so that it's seamless. So in other words, in your mind, you're thinking I'm replacing one word. In my mind, I'm thinking I'm 30 minutes in the studio to replace your one word because of the process that I have to get into and the headspace to correct that that one fix. So you're not just paying for fixing of one word. You're, you're paying for um, my time to, to orchestrate this change so that it's seamless and continuity is constant on your side, you know. So, you know, we had a recent thing. I'm, it's, it's a recent example because about two weeks ago, one of the companies um, that I do stuff for, for the on-hold things, um, they wanted a couple of sentences added to their, their system. Um, but then they thought they were going to get it at a low cost because just a couple of sentences. And I had to explain to the, the, the production guy, like, okay, well and good, but remember, the process involves not only recording, the on hold, I, I, what are they called? IBX systems, whatever they're called. They have to have the audio again encoded in a separate format to the usual um, audio format that, that you know, you'd use. So if it's a WAV file for on hold systems, depending on what, what system it is, it'll be like uh, ULAW, 8 bit mono, you know, the, all these other things. So now you, you, you know, sometimes then transferring that audio into a different bit of software that will allow you to convert it and, you know. So it's, it's, it's a process. Essentially, they're thinking just two sentences, you know, like they, they almost in their minds thinking I'm going to just do a voice note and press send. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas like, no, I'm, I'm probably going to be 30 minutes or if it's not me, I'm, I'm sharing it with somebody who can then encode it. There's, there's costs involved, you know. Okay. So, do, yeah. Do yeah. you enjoy listening to your voice? Depends. Or <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what it is. <laughs> Um, you know what it is? There's some times when I know that there's a nice energy in, in a, in a voiceover or in a, in a podcast, which has my, my thing, because I'm listening to it and I'm feeling the frequency and the vibe in it that even I'm smiling, then I know it's worked. So that from that angle, I enjoy it, but not in a narcissistic way. I'm not like, yeah. It's my voice, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's my voice, man. Better recognize. No, no. Most times it's because at the core of it, and this is what I've understood now um, in terms of growth, is that when you distill it to its to its minimum, what we're doing is we're transferring a vibe. I'm transferring an energy. I'm transferring a vibe. And these are the tools that allow me to do that. And that's 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 all it is. So if if it's a sale for a product and I'm involved in uh, get this for nineteen ninety nine and uh, you know, hurry while stocks last, all that kind of stuff, I'm transferring that fun energy vibe, which is meant to be enticing and lock you into thinking about going and and buying something that's on sale. If it's a sad uh, read where I'm trying to evoke your emotions to donate, like the there's one ad that that I did for the Guide Dogs Association of South Africa, which was shortlisted for Best International VoiceOver Performance at the One Voice Awards in Texas this year. Um, and that one was one way, I'm, my, my role is to get you to consider being a person that donates money to the Guide Dogs Association um, to allow people to have the freedom to walk around um, with, with the aid of, of Guide Dogs. And so that one, I'm meant to give a performance that tugs at your heartstrings, you know. So um, it's meant to be as sincere as possible, non-pretentious, non-acting, and whatever I can do to get into that zone as a performer uh, with, with the right amount of empathy, that's my role so that, you know, I communicate. But what's, what's that doing? Back to what I was saying, I'm transferring a vibe. I'm transferring an energy through the read. So, an emotion. Yeah, an emotion, exactly. So that's why when people say, you know, to tell me about, I'm, I'm starting out, please share with me about breathing exercise for voiceover or whatnot. I'm not trained. I don't know all that stuff, you know. All I know is that 
these words that are on a, on 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 paper by the time I'm done uh you shouldn't even think that I was reading because yeah. I'm essentially just communicating a message as best as I can but uh you know capturing it as, as a vibe I suppose that's, that's the best way I could put it okay yeah. your your voice is basically your life you mm. know mm. and for others for me now that's where the growth uh, conversation comes in because the way you did your voice over maybe 15 years ago and today is not the same yeah there has been growth you learn you study you you master yourself and how is that process like for you because others for example is for example if I'm an accountant i have mm. to read books or what are the trends so i'm up to date you get yeah. the point I, yeah. i i'm still relevant i'm still mm. responding to the current market demands for you is this a voice people think you can just sleep two years and just wake up and it's still as good you know mm. how how do you consistently keep making it better because i'm i think at the core of it i'm a student and so when i'm in a session and i'm getting feedback sometimes sometimes guys are in there giving you feedback where you know it's about getting a better outcome it's not like i'm a director and i'm here for a power flex uh those guys eventually i end up blocking their numbers and not working with them again if they're there just to kind of you know be, be a nuisance and just kind of direct and, you know so that you their their ego is is met but there's some people who genuinely want the outcome of the ad to to be something next level so certain guys i mean i meant there's a podcast episode where i actually mentioned guys like uh, adam lomas who was there during that Coca-Cola pop stars recording as a sound engineer but now he's directed me in so many ads over the years that we become very close friends another guy called Sandile Sandile is a great director who when he's giving you direction you know that he's he's all about elevating you know, what's what's what what the delivery is you we can improve this part we can improve that part so slowly those things start um the residue of those those messages and the the direction that you get sits with you and becomes part of your performance going forward so um in terms of growth it's it's incremental growth like that which after many years you can listen to a recording you did you know uh like there's a recording out there which I did I think in 2000 for Fanta and when I listen to that thing I'm thinking there's so many other ways knowing what I know now that I could have approached that particular ad but uh at the time i thought i was you know that was perfect um so i i think with particularly what i do it's just time and and experience you know and and lots of uh people who are seasoned and skilled in your ear whose messages start you know landing and you use that in the next session um and so you know thousands of voice over sessions later that's that's how you you hone it in it's difficult to because it, you know in in other respects you could kind of say there's that guy i'm going to study him and i'm going to be like that but that's not that's not the way you win in this industry because you still have to have that unique thing so for example uh when i started out i'm saying for example a lot but you know i've got <laughs> examples when i started out it would be like um please do this voice over and we want it to sound like the the give me a name and most times if i know the guys who who they're referring to then i'd i'd kind of fashion it in, in that way then came a time when I'd get like scripts and they say yeah just make it chillish because apparently there's a there's a flavor that I bring you know yeah yeah give us more of that chillu thing <laughs> so you realize oh, okay now now I'm also becoming an example you know of uh, of a reference I'm, I'm becoming a reference point um but but all that stuff happens just you know incrementally as you have more experience under your belt i suppose have you ever gotten a request for exclusivity maybe like a bank say we want you to do we want you to be the only bank you do a voice for or a telco says we want you to be the only telco that you do a voice for so exclusivity is is a tricky thing because if somebody then suggests that the amount of money that they have to put forward is substantial so people avoid it and so what ends up happening more times than not is they'll ask you have you been on a bank you know competing bank ad in the last 6 months if you say yes they they look elsewhere because they don't want to really pay an exclusivity fee because it's 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 so big but out of respect sometimes I do do that like I'll get a request for um you know a bank ad um and this happened I think if if I remember correctly happened um maybe like 2 years ago where I was asked to do an ad and for for a different bank and I was like but in in that region I'm very synonymous with Atlas Mara this was like maybe a couple of years ago so it might not work out to your to your favor i i i advise the guy you know 
and uh, then it's up to him to make the decision. But then sometimes I also have to insulate myself because if at the time that he's asking, I'm getting a lot of work from Atlas Mara. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> piss them off. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, you know, decline respectfully because I know that right now that's the season for, for this particular brand. Um, currently, I'm not doing Atlas Mara stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I have flexibility to, to do other other brands, but it's it's more more sometimes than just conversations that happen not so formally because I do think um, once the word exclusivity is mentioned, the amount of money you have to fork out sometimes is ridiculous, and so people sometimes keep away. Okay, mm. and running your 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 business, I I know that you you are under an agent. Mm. Um, for some people, there's that thing where, like, I'm the voice. Why should mm. I get an agent? It's, it's <laughs> I can do it without them. <laughs> what, what, what difference does it make? Because also that also speaks to, like, even here in Zambia, talent for influencers and whatnot. Mm. You find one person says, I can manage myself. Yeah. Someone else feels like they need a manager. We can't all be good at everything. So I did share that for about three years I was doing stuff of my own. There's a lot of work when you are exclusively um, doing stuff on your own. I mean, I've, I've got uh, help. Like my wife's like a brilliant person when it comes to admin. She's an accountant uh, by profession and she's very systems orientated compared to me. I'm very arty, arty, you know. So so it, it, it can work out. But then what happens with an agent is that they take a lot of the headache off you in terms of admin because when you're operating on your own, Maybe you've got like four or five sessions in a day. Then you get a phone call and somebody says, please send me a quotation urgently. We need to give it to you know our client. Now I'm going to have to also find time in the day to look at that rate card, find the formula for the usage, find, you know, all that, all that stuff, which takes you know, time in your day. Whereas if you have an agent, they have that headache. You just point you know, the query to them and then they sort out the, the headache of sorting out what this particular deal will cost. When it comes to, to invoicing, they'll take care of that headache. Uh, when it comes to following up on payment, they'll take care of that. And if the agent is, is, is a good agent, they're also involved in marketing you. And agents also sometimes have exclusive deals with uh, certain um, companies that you might not have reached into ordinarily. So uh, for instance, um, earlier on, I talked about the stuff that I do for, for BBC Africa. All, all those things are locked in because of the agent that I work with because they have that relationship, you know. So that was introduced to me um, during my, my time with this agent. So, so there, there is merit in, in, in working with an agent if the agent is, is good because, um, yeah, so some agents are worth their salt because they're all about maximizing your reach and maximizing how much you work because obviously then they also are going to get you know, 25% of that is 25. They're going to get a percentage. I can't remember what the percentage actually is. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a tango. You're, 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 it's, 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 um, it's, it's a collaboration which, which can work very nicely. Okay. Looking mm. back, what mistakes did you make and what did you learn from them? Generally, or I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> no, in, in, in terms of your, in, like in connection with your craft. Um, let's see, which big ones? I... I, th I, I wouldn't say mistakes per se because I think everything that happens happens for a reason and you can learn from it. So at, at the moment, it's a very good question. None is coming to mind where I can pinpoint, but I'm, I'm one of those guys who, who thinks um, that if, if I do something, it's usually well thought, thought out. Um, and so um, there's some deals that I've not gone for because maybe... It's for some simple reason as, as I don't like the vibe of the person that's, that I'm dealing with. And in their mind, they'll be like, but I'm bringing a lot of money. In my mind, like, I'm, I'm going to be spending hours with you and that's not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm insulating my, my mental health. So there's sometimes when I second guess myself and then later on I realize, okay, that was a good decision. Uh, but the jury is out between the time that you make the decision and months later, you know. So uh, there's a company that I used to work with for a long time, but man, I didn't enjoy dealing with them. They used to do a lot of uh, bank communication. Um, and it, it, it was a, a long working relationship, 
but I found that, and, and you know, as I say that, I realized, no, they're actually two companies. And, and I realized that I'm not, you know, my, I'm, I'm, each time I deal with them, I'm, I'm getting like, you know, in my fields, <laughs> either because of how they're directing the job or either how the MD or that particular company kind of looks down on guys who are arty because in their mind, I think maybe they're blue chip or whatever. And so after a while, I thought like, you know, this, this, this is not working for me. So I thought, let me just block these chaps, you know, so I blocked them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then after a while, and I do that a lot, just, you know, to let you know, after a while, like some months later, this guy calls me and, and uh, he says, yo, we've tried to reach you. Uh, did you change your number? So I'm like, ah, no, <laughs> <laughs> just didn't enjoy dealing with you guys. Uh, how, you know, so you explain, you know, that you, what, what it was. Um, and there's a second company, as I say that, because, you know, I'm, I'm Mr. Blocker now. There's a second company. I've got, I got the email yesterday uh, from, I'm looking at, yeah, I, I could pull it out. But there's one session where this lady who owns a company was just so disrespected. I felt so disrespected, you know, within the session. Um, and after I left the, the session, I thought, you know, like, should I deal with her again? And I was, you know, wondering whether I should, and I'm, I'm probably veering away from your question, but I think it's important. Um, so I eventually, I blocked her, you know, and then I was on holiday with the family and then got uh, an email saying, I've been trying to reach you. Have you changed your number? And I responded, I said, no, just just not looking actually to work with you again. Because I have to think like, do I respond now? Because now she's reached me by email. Not looking to work with you again. Um, there, there was that incident with that particular session, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I explained, you know, in, in like a bullet point. And she writes back and she apologizes and says, no, sorry, I was stressed that day, etc." So I respond and say, no, thank you so much for your response. I didn't expect her to respond like that because of her attitude. Um, but I was so touched on that day that I even recorded a podcast episode called The Voiceover and Director Tango. You can look it up on Voiceover Plug where, where I discussed that incident. Anyway. That done, I'm thinking, you know, at least we're done. Sends an email now two weeks ago saying, uh, there's a number of jobs that I've got coming up. Uh, please, would you reconsider working with me? Uh, and I'll leave my stress at the door this time around or something like that. And now I have the, the you know, a decision to make. I haven't responded to her uh, as, as, as we have this conversation. Do I go back on my initial instincts or do I let her back and know that she'll behave differently? My, you, you tell me what you think I should do. My instinct is I'm not going to respond to the email because I'm, I'm done. You know what I mean? It's not like her business adds much to my bottom line in any case. And I'm insulating my energy. Um, you know, for me, I've moved on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking to, to be in her ecosystem. What would you do? <laughs> for, for me, the fact that uh, that person gave you that sort of like, um, you know, thinking, to lead to block them means mm. whatever attitude they had or whatever energy they had was really bad. Mm. But for the same person mm. to respond in a way you did not expect and apologize, mm. then you know there is some remorse and this person actually may just, you may just have caught them at a bad time. Because mm. really, if they were that proud and that arrogant and that attitude, they would not have responded to you and said, you know what, I'll find out a voice of a guy out, you know. Yeah. But also, it may be because like, they want the chill vibe. So the thing the is, wish, the right? thing is, what I'm, I, I guess I'm less trusting about people because within that email of apology, the initial one, there was at the end like, if you do ever change your mind, please let me know. For me, that kind of still speaks to like, are you apologizing because your play is like, okay, if I apologize and put that thing, maybe we can still work together because you know you're needed in my. Oh yeah, like thing. apologizing is a condition for us to work together. Yeah, yeah, and, it's and not like I don't mean it, but ask and the work to get done. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, like I didn't expect it, but there's still that thing where you're kind of thinking. It's it's you know yeah, it's she, like everything was going the on reason the sentence. reason why she's successful at bringing all those jobs is because she's a brilliant marketer and she's a charmer. So how, on how do I know <laughs> that she's, the charm is not working on me? You know, so so that's the thing. I'm caught up in two uh, minds, you've and got, uh, you've got a decision to make. You've yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, look, we we we're almost coming to an end, but but I'm going to ask for a favor because I think Chilo can just come in here and walk out <laughs> doing doing for us what Kamiza did for us. So, oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed that Kamiza interview, by the way, man. I'm that, glad you liked yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, I've got three lines for the podcast. Okay, yeah, bring them yeah. on. Um, and also this will give on, a, on your brilliant Mac. Yeah. Book, yeah, cherry rose is it cherry rose a <laughs> color? Is it rose gold or something? Rose gold, yeah, rose, rose gold. gold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so 
I want people to get first, you know, hand like okay. into what goes into making a yeah. voice. Yeah. Uh, are you like one of those one take kind of guys in your outfit? No. <laughs> in fact, I, I shared a video which which I saw, which I was like, "Wow, this is fantastic!" Last week, where there's a lady that does um, uh, kind of um, videos on voiceover and gives tips, and she says there is a myth that pe- voiceover artists do things in one take. It's a myth. Most of us do numerous takes. There's a guy who's helping me edit now, I th- and uh, I think he's kind of amazed because I'll do a long form thing, but I'm, I don't know if it's uh, getting jaded because editing those things takes a long time. So I've got a system where, which I used to edit. It's like a system that I saw online when I, you know people do audio books. So what you do is, uh, this might sound very geeky if you're not into uh, audio, but you you are. So when I'm reading a thing and then I make an error, I I either click finger or now I've even got a dog clicker and what that does is on the wave file in your software there's a big spike yeah, it's like and a clap that, like a clap exactly exactly so those claps represent where the error is so that when you're editing you just kind of know like, okay this just pull these wave files okay. to the left to the left so it, to, it sounds like a Beyonce song to the left to the left <laughs> and then eventually <laughs> you'll have like a clean flowing recording in a shorter time than trying to figure out if there are no markers on the recording you know so it's like a very maybe archaic way of doing it but it works so the guy who's helping me now to edit stuff uh, I send him a file and I think he's getting yeah, it and because you know. also even for me like I used to edit a lot what other people have done, it's yeah. hard to edit when you, you you are not there. Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. But when you are you like when you said like when you send those, I can just look out for them. Like okay, yes. one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So okay, one I've dealt with two, five. Yeah. But where I was not there, I may have to listen to the whole thirty minutes exactly, and exactly, look for exactly, where the errors exactly, were. Exactly. We're sounding geeky. I'm telling you, man. Your <laughs> your growth French. podcast audience don't know so, about uh, wave files. There are three of them. Uh, each one obviously is on its own. Okay, uh, cool. I'm looking for the chilluish vibe. Okay, cool. I should just AI let AI do. Do this ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> in Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> we tap into the Hindi audience. <laughs> okay, cool. So you want me to do the first one? Yes. So this is the thing. You know, you know, my eyesight's bad. So I'm putting these on not to look cool, but these are prescription sunglasses. Oh, okay. So I can look at the script properly. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The prescription. So I'm not, I'm not doing this to be like a, like know, a musician. Yeah, like you know, Chilu's like you know now he's that guy. Has shades indoors. Okay, so should I do the first one? Yes. Do you want to clap it? <laughs> ah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Welcome to the Growth Podcast. We're all about unlocking your full potential and helping you to become the best version of yourself. Join us on this exciting journey of personal growth and development. Prepare to be inspired, motivated, and equipped with the tools you need to grow in different aspects of your life. Our guests bring their experience and stories to help you find yourself. And now, over to your host, Suilanji Siame. Ah, so that's that's the yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that so you say you, you do many takes. For me, that's like it was the pressure of your show, man. You're, you're sounding like I sent this to you yesterday. <laughs> and this is a cold read. I rarely do cold reads. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was fluke. I'm probably gonna butcher the next one. Should I go for the next one? <laughs> yeah, go to the next. Okay, one. cool. This week on the Growth Podcast. Wait, this week on the Growth Podcast. Probably the second take. Yeah. And then you you want an outro. Yes. That's it for this edition of the Growth Podcast. Be sure to join us again next week for another insightful conversation. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and leave a comment, and tell a friend about the podcast. There's something interesting I was going to say just now. You see, because of being in South Africa, I'm saying podcast. If you're listening to American ones, they'll say podcast. Right? I can't remember the difference. I say, I say pod- <laughs> How do you say it? Podcast. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so we're just like for there. Yeah, yeah. You know? So yeah, yeah, we've flattened the A's nicely. No, no. I was on your podcast last week. That's a very good. I was on your podcast last week. That's uh, yeah, because because yeah. there are some people I know who've got very good voices, but they don't know how to use them. Dude, it's it's like that same thing. You're transferring a vibe. So, like for example, I've, I've done a number of these in different forms in different ways let me take this <laughs> and so I, I i kind of because of that my memory is kind of helping me to decide what to do with this sentence because i've i've within my life done a similar thing not specifically this but i've done a similar thing so it's locking me in so for instance when i say the word celebration usually there'll be like a mini a little bit more love that i'll give to the sibilance on the first uh syllable 
to make it sound. So every every time I think you hear me on an ad say it, it'll usually be a celebration. You know, what I mean, you when you celebrate that little love that you give, the emphasis that you give to the to the sibilance at the beginning makes it sound like it's a celebration. You know. Yeah. So and, and for me, like I've, I've also gotten used to knowing your voice is coming. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like on Zambezi yeah. Magic. When yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Ah, I know. Ah, ah, this week like, on Zambezi Magic. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> on it's, it's, Pali. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. <laughs> but but the other thing I know, I know we're about to wrap is yeah. that I shouldn't actually take credit for a number of these things in totality because what happens is when I get a script, there'll be a guide voice. And little love is given to the guys that do guide voices, particularly for DSTV promos. So they'll send you the script, they'll send you the video, and the video usually has a guide voice of how they want they're envisioning sound. it. Yes. yes. So sometimes what I do, especially if there's time, um, especially for stuff, uh, well, yeah, is is that I'll listen to the guide voice and sometimes sentence by sentence do a take where I'm mimicking the guide voice almost exactly. And then from there, I'll save that as take one. Then I'll do my interpretation as take two. And then I'll send, maybe I'll do another take, you know, maybe three takes and send those. And I'm usually curious to see which one they they went with. And sometimes it's the guide voice. So when I listen to it, some of the decisions that were made to tackle a specific sentence might not be the way that I would because I've, I've mimicked the guide voice in totality. But then I'll understand that that actually works better, you know. Um, so yeah, that that sometimes happens. So there's sometimes unsung heroes. Even the one that I talked about, which which was nominated for best international performance, uh, the director Dominic Black had actually done a guide voice, and so he laid the foundation of how he wanted that freedom ad to sound. And then I started workshopping it and workshopping it until I, you know, did did my thing on it. Yeah. Okay. Have you thought about doing football commentary? Um. No, I'd suck. <laughs> I tell you now. <laughs> Why is it? Because you're not into the sport, or no? I'm into the sport because I, I hear your Premier League promos. Yeah, those are those are scripted by guys who know their stuff. No, because yeah, what, it is, what it what it is is, and I shared a clip with Kamiza actually recently of a guy who does like Champions League commentary and stuff like that. The amount of prep this guy goes into a game like with a whole book with his handwritten notes. Yeah, I've seen that. You've for, seen that in Zambia for with um, Matim Bankon. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So the amount of prep that goes into such stuff, um, that that's the pre-written stuff, like for the intro and all that kind of stuff. The outro, that that other video which I saw, the guy even had like, if this happens, this, this is this saying. is what I'm saying. If that happens, this is what I'm saying, and it's intense. And over and above that, you're also ad libbing based on your understanding of the game and so on. So that's why you know some some things I'm, I wouldn't I'd would make a terrible football commentator I'd make a terrible news reader, um, yeah I've, I've tried news reading that I know it's not for me because um, you have to have a, a proper interest in current affairs uh, ordinarily it has to be in your DNA for you to approach news successfully and um, that's not really me. <laughs> yeah. What five things would you give to to young creatives as advice? Five things you'd give as advice? Be yourself. Um, don't overthink things. Learn from as many people as you can and, and uh, Google and YouTube by your friend in that respect. Um, don't get in your own way. This is one thing that I'm learning myself now because sometimes you, you might, you know, create certain expectations in, in terms of how things are. Then if somebody brings a different view, um, you might be so much in your own way that you won't listen to that view and take it on because you know that could that could improve you. That's four, right? Yeah. Five. Um, and this this might be a, like a weird one, but give as much, give give flowers to people that that help either help help you along the way, or guys that you just kind of think are doing a good job without any expectation. So. Um, this is the last time I'm going to say, for example, in your show. For example, <laughs> <laughs> we were at the Kwacha Music Awards uh, presenting an award together, right? Yeah. Both of us noticed how Loti Lungu was like manically making sure that the show is a success in every aspect. This is my first time, as far as I know, to, to meet this gentleman. But I was amazed at how he was just like, if a, a guy isn't there to receive his award, uh, he steps on stage. I'm like, well, there's, there's Loti. 
he's in the background. If they're trying to find people, he's sending instructions. People are panicking around him and he's like, guys, be calm, be calm. You're looking for so-and-so, let me phone him. He's he's the, the I don't know if, if I should say the spirit of the show. And I'm just watching this from afar. So I have two choices. Like we're done with our, our thing. I might, choice one is just go home and do your thing. Choice two is on your way, which is what I did. Send this guy a voice note because I've got his number. I'm like, bro, what I saw, maybe no one will tell you, but when you do get to sleep at 4 a.m., just salute to you, man, because <laughs> what you are doing. And, and I've got no expectation of anything. I'm just kind of like sharing something which I think he should hear that, you know, it's appreciated, you know, and, and he should, he should uh, be saluted. Yeah, so, no, like I, I agree with you about yeah. giving people their flowers because yeah. to be honest when you do something wrong yeah uh, yeah people uh, are uh, on uh. you <laughs> <laughs> because I, 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 and that's how it is for most people you know you've done something right when yes. no one says anything yes that's what yes, 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 yes I'm yes, doing the right yes, thing yes, yes. the moment you do something wrong and mm. you come and they won't shy away yeah but when you create a culture of that was good yes that was good feedback I like yeah. how you did that Like uh, people feel like okay I'm if, even in places where I'm not doing this for money. I'm not getting a lot of money out of it. Mm, mm. But that's what keeps me moving. Exactly. You know, that's what keeps me moving. Yeah. But when I do the right thing, you're quiet. I wonder, mm. am I appreciated? Yeah. Am I do, can I do better? Can I what? We have to create a culture. And exactly. also as Zambians, we're not very frank with each other. Yeah. yeah like, yeah, yeah, let me tell you that. The good things. Like, ah, not yeah, yeah, that was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. But I said, not that was good. But I feel like you can improve here and there. Yeah. 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 Then don't going to even think about the good that you say. Exactly. Like you're just going to hang up. Yeah. 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 Two yeah. people used to do that to me. I, I don't even want to rap. Uh, Maureen Bongola, uh, who's now late, she used to be in a band called Am Amber 04 or Amber 04. And when I'd get off air, she'd come and, um, you know, just share like some positivity uh um mateo piri used to do that as well Matty p um when i was at radio phoenix hey, i'm fine huh? this is a joke you told but the other one you know but he just kind of like out of goodness show you that i'm listening i'm, I'm a legend in my own right but i'm listening to you and here uh you know are some nuggets take them you know don't take them it's all good all right yeah. Mr. Lemba, thank you very much for thank coming you, through. Uh, it's actually funny how we met, but uh, yeah, look, <laughs> we're here. You're going back to SA tomorrow. Uh, so, like, are you a citizen there now? No, no, I'm not a citizen. Are you pushing yeah. to be a citizen there? No, I'm, I'm, I'm a permanent resident. My family, they're all citizens, but... Uh, oh, they're all citizens? Yeah, I'm still carrying my, my Zambian passport. <laughs> Zambia Kuchalo. <laughs> it's funny how we, when you go, you see when there are those posts on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Where people joke about, I'm leaving Zambia. I'm stuff of this country. You know I mean? <laughs> and there's you who's, you know, holding on to but, that. But interesting flag. enough, I'm, I'm a play your part ambassador for Brand SA. So. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. That was part of the. I think I heard that in the interview with the Newsroom Africa. Yes, 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 yes. So I'm a player part ambassador. I should be doing the same for Zambia. You should be yeah, make some phone calls. For Zambia, <laughs> Zamb no, Zambia <laughs> tourism, you know. Yeah, I know. You <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> yeah. I think you should, you, you should voice over us out. Should I? Yeah. You've been watching the Growth Podcast. Till next time, take care.